Well, the message today is entitled, From Pain to Praise. Many of these songs that we've sung have pertained to suffering, and that's what we're going to discuss today in the message from Psalm 3. So you can turn your Bible there as as we prepare. From Pain to Praise. You know, one of the main themes we hear about whenever we hear the Word of God being taught to us is that of suffering. Suffering is all around us, and so we hear messages uh, on suffering regularly. I mean, if you were to turn on Christian radio, if you listen to those various ministries of preaching uh, on Christian radio, more than likely, at least once a day, you'll probably hear some message directly focused on suffering. We're taught how to understand suffering, how to endure suffering, how to respond to suffering, We're often reminded of passages like James 1, verses 3 and 4, which says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Or, we're often reminded of 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, which say, In this you greatly rejoice. Even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, I haven't certainly done any counting, but I would guess that those are among some of the top read or preached on passages in the New Testament. These passages are often written in the context of persecution in the first century. But, of course, the truths that are in them are universal. They apply to all kinds of suffering. Even just in the last few years, we've heard a number of very powerful and helpful messages from our own Pastor Leek on suffering. A man who has suffered greatly and ministered the Word of God to us. When we hear messages on suffering or perhaps read books on suffering, it's often in the context of unexpected health challenges or grief over the loss of loved one or other kinds of losses or persecution. But there is another kind of suffering I want us to consider this morning, one that if you've experienced it, might cause you to kind of ignore and set aside the messages that you hear thinking, well, my suffering is different, so those truths don't apply to me. I want to study God's word with you, considering how to respond to suffering that is the result, directly or indirectly, to your own sin. All of us, at one level or another, have experienced, and maybe even are experiencing right now, consequences, difficulties, challenges, suffering that is the result of our sin, where we we can connect the dots. Here's what I did, and therefore here's what I'm experiencing. Perhaps there's immorality in your past, and you're still experiencing the consequences of that. Perhaps you didn't raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and now as adults they've turned against you. Maybe you've skirted the law at work and lost your job or even your career. Maybe your health is complicated by sinful habits of the past. Perhaps you weren't following the Lord earlier in life, and now your life is a wreck, your marriage and family. Or maybe during this last year, as you've been spending an abundant time at home, there's been more friction, and your own sinful responses to that friction have exacerbated the problems. There are a litany of sins Stealing, lying, cheating, drunkenness, that all have lasting consequences. Well, it doesn't matter what your particular sins were or what kind of suffering you're experiencing. This message from God's word is for you this morning. Now, at the same time, the principles that we're going to consider and learn from God's word are universal. So no matter what kind of suffering or why you're suffering in that way, This is still a message from God to you. And we could go even beyond that 
All of us, those of us who have put our faith in Christ, are ministers of Christ, and therefore, I want you to be listening not only for your own sake, but to hear what the Spirit says to those who suffer, so that when you encounter someone who suffers, which we all will, that you know how to minister some truth and grace to them as well. Well, with that in mind, I want to give you a one-sentence summary of this text, and this will actually serve as the outline for today. When persecutors rise, recall your protector, rest in peace, raise your petition, and rise in prayer. Let me say it again. When persecutors rise, recall your protector, rest in peace, raise your petition, and rise in praise. We'll repeat that numerous times throughout. Well, if you're not there yet, I would invite you to open your Bible to Psalm 3, where we find David responding to a time of suffering that can be directly traced back to his sin. In fact, if you look at the superscription uh, at the beginning of the psalm, it says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. If you remember just a few weeks ago, Pastor Leek preached on Psalm 63, which was also written during this same period. In Psalm 63, it's through the, the content of the psalm that we can come to a pretty good conclusion that that's when David wrote this psalm. But here we don't have to even think about it. The Spirit himself has revealed it to us. The events where David that led to David fleeing from Absalom are found in 2 Samuel chapter 15. But in order to understand why David was, was even in that situation to begin with, we have to go back 11 years in David's life to see how his own sin resulted in him leaving or fleeing from Absalom and thus writing this psalm. So put your finger here. I know we haven't read the passage yet, but, but I wanted to take you here so you could put your finger and then go back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel Chapter 12. We don't have time to read through the three or four chapters that cover this season of David's life, but we're just going to do a flyover and drop in on some of the key turning points just to get an idea of what has happened that has led to Psalm 3. When we start here in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we are immediately following the passage of David's own sin of his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. I trust you're familiar enough with that account that we don't need to go through it in detail, but suffice it to say that David, the man after God's own heart, committed adultery and murdered the woman's husband to cover it up. These two sins are the catalyst for all the suffering that David would experience the rest of his life. We know that because that's what God revealed to him through the prophet Nathan in verses 9 to 12. Look at that with me. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 to 12. This is Nathan speaking. Why have you despised the word of the Lord doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the Son. Now it might appear from those words that God has taken his favor away from David, but that would be a mistaken notion. You see, God had made his covenant with David back in chapter 7, and God knew even at that time what David was going to do in his life. He knew the sins that David was going to commit, and yet he still made his covenant with David. And so these words by the Lord do not at all revoke the covenant that God made with David. In fact, we must remember that God's faithfulness is not dependent on our sin. 
David's sin did not remove the blessings of God. And the blessings of God also, on the other hand, didn't remove the consequences of David's life or the sin from David's life. Let me say that again. David's sin did not remove God's blessing from his life, but neither did God's blessing remove the consequences of sin from David's life. Or let me put it another way. Your sin, my sin, does not disqualify us from the grace of God. Amen? So long as you repent of it. Romans 5.20 says, Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. But when you receive God's grace and forgiveness, it doesn't always remove the natural consequences of that sin. God's grace removes the wrath of God that that sin deserves, but it doesn't always take away the temporal consequences. So now let's look at what those consequences were for David in his life. Look at chapter 13 of 2 Samuel, verse 1. Now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. I'm going to pause right there. If you don't know anything about David's family, uh, this will be very confusing to you, so let me explain it. David's first six sons were from six different wives. Okay, Amnon is the firstborn son of David. Absalom is the third son of David, both from different wives. So Am- Absalom and Tamar are brother and sister from the same mother. Okay? That's, that's the connection between those three. Now, Absalom, it says here, um, in, in, the, in the further on in the text, it says that Amnon, excuse me, loved Tamar. In fact, we could say he was in lust for her. The law of God teaches in Leviticus that it is wrong for step-siblings to be in a relationship. And so Amnon knew that this was not going to be possible. His father was the same as her father, same man. So their father, who happens to be the highest legal authority in the land, he was not going to let any kind of relationship take place. And so, driven by his own lust, Amnon takes counsel from a wicked friend who also happens to be a cousin and plans to violate Tamar to get her in a vulnerable place. Tragically, he carries out this plan and he rapes Tamar. Now look at verses 21 and 22 here of chapter 13. Now when King David heard all these matters, he was very angry. But Absalom did not speak to Amnon either good or bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. King David, father of both perpetrator and victim, does nothing. He gets angry but does not bring justice to bear. Absalom, the brother of Tamar, again, also gets angry, but he doesn't say anything to Amnon. He doesn't lash out. He he bides his time for when he will get his revenge. Yes, obviously, Amnon sinned grievously, but David also sinned by allowing injustice to win the day. Now, the text doesn't tell us why David didn't do anything Was it because he looked at his own past and thought, what right do I have to judge my son when he's just committing sin in ways that I committed sin as well? Well, we don't know that, but perhaps. Well, certain that his father could not or could overlook rape, but not murder. uh, Absalom fled. I forgot to mention that two years after this, Absalom put his own plan together and he ended up murdering Amnon. So initially Absalom did nothing, bided his time, he murders Amnon. And again, recognizing that David couldn't overlook that, he runs away. He goes to live with his grandfather, Talmai, son of the king of Jeshur, which is an area outside of Israel, east of the Sea of Galilee. So he's out of the land of Israel, he's fleeing for his life, he's seeking refuge with his mother's family. And he stays there for about three years, okay? Three years. Now look at chapter 13, verses 39 to chapter 14, verse 1. 
The heart of King David longed to go out to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Now Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was inclined toward Absalom. So time passes by, and David gets comforted in his heart, and now he misses his son Absalom, even though he's murdered as one of his other sons. His long desires to see Absalom again. As you read further in the passage, David gets convinced to bring Absalom back, basically promising protection and safety that Absalom won't be punished for his crime. So after several years, Absalom comes back, but oddly, David refuses actually to see Absalom. And so Absalom is living in Jerusalem. He's a prince, if you will, so he has resources, but he has nothing to do. And the king won't see him, so he has no reconciliation. So what does he do? Well, he harbors bitterness and anger in his heart for two full years. Okay, now look over at chapter 14, verse 33. So when Joab came to the king and told him, he called for Absalom. That is, uh, uh, Absalom asked for a, a visit with the king. Thus he came to the king and prostrated himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. So there's a reconciliation that takes place. After two full years, Joab, who is one of King David's leaders, convinces David, listen, you got you got to see your son. This is ridiculous. And so Absalom comes in. He prostrates himself. They reconcile. Or at least it appears that way. For Absalom's part, he's just doing this so that he can later subvert the king without suspicion. So five years after Absalom's murder, father and son reconcile. Now look at chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. Now it came about after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men as runners before him. Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And when any man had a suit, to come to the king for judgment, that's a lawsuit, this isn't a fashion show, Absalom could, would call to him and say, from what city are you? And he would say, your servant is from the tribes of Israel. But Absalom would say to him, see, your claims are good and right, but no man listens to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any suit or cause could come to me and I would give him justice. When a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. I know the relative pronouns are confusing, but basically when someone would come before Absalom, Absalom would make a judgment, he would make a determination. That person would then come near to Absalom and he would kiss Absalom's hand. And we remember we talked about last week from Psalm 2 that kissing him is a sign of loyalty and a sign of devotion. So Absalom did this for four years. Hundreds, thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people came to Jerusalem seeking justice from the king. Instead, they got justice from Absalom, who took that mantle upon himself. And Absalom turned the hearts of Israel against David and toward himself. Now look at verse 7. Now it came about at the end of 40 years, now it should be translated four Four years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. So basically, Absalom comes to the king. He's he's still under the king's authority, and so he has to request permission to leave Jerusalem because of the circumstances. And so he feigns submission. He feigns respect. I'm coming to you, king. I'm seeking your permission. I just want to go pay a vow. I want to fulfill an obligation down in Hebron, which is about 20 miles south of Jerusalem. But again, he's doing this in order to subvert the king. So he goes to Hebron, and there he calls the people of Israel to himself, and they anoint him king. And they start the 20-mile trek north to depose David off his throne, all of Israel being led by Absalom. Well, when David finally finds out in verse 13 there of chapter 15, he decides to flee rather than to face Absalom and fight to the death. So he takes his family, most of his servants, and those loyal to him, and they begin their own 20-mile trek east, from your vantage point, east, to Jordan. 
to flee from the oncoming nation. Now look at chapter 16, verse 14. The king and all the people who were with him arrived, that is, arrived at the Jordan, weary, and he refreshed himself there. So here they are at the Jordan, totally uncertain of what's about to take place. Not sure what to do, not sure where to go. The entire nation is against him. And I believe it's at this point that David writes Psalm 3. So let's turn back there and see what he says, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let me read it. The Psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are, how many adversaries, excuse me, O Lord, how many, how my adversaries have increased. I think I need new glasses. (laughs) O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Remember, when persecutors rise, recall your protector, rest in peace, raise your petition, and rise in praise. Remember, when persecutors rise, Having adversaries was, of course, nothing new to David. His life was basically defined by his enemies. As a young man, his foes were lions and and, uh, bears. And then Goliath became his most famous enemy. Saul was his most persistent adversary. The Philistines were his most enduring foe. But Absalom, and now the nation of Israel... They were his most heartbreaking adversaries. Absalom, of course, was his son. The nation of Israel was his country. Both were his flesh and his blood. But but that's not all. They were his most heartbreaking adversaries because David knew in his heart of hearts that what was happening right now was really the result of his own sin. He knew that his own adultery, his own act of murder, his refusal to deal with Amnon the way he was supposed to and to deal with Absalom the way that he was supposed to, all of that culminated into this moment. Now, he wasn't responsible for Absalom's sin, but he was experiencing the consequences of his own sin. There was another aspect that made this different in terms of his enemies. A victory over his other enemies made him a public hero. But now he is public enemy number one. That's why people were saying, even God can't save him now. The whole nation is against him. Well, David also knew that neither his sin nor the strength of his enemy could invalidate the faithfulness of God. That's why he writes these words. He turns to the Lord in the midst of the rising of his enemies. Friends, no matter what your sin in the past is, God is still God. And God is still faithful to his promises. In this psalm, David acknowledges his adversaries. He recognizes who they are. He's not dismissing that reality, but he doesn't focus on them. Instead, he focuses on the Lord. Our suffering is often compounded because we focus more 
on our enemies or our troubles and difficulties more than on the Lord. Our mind is more filled with the words and the actions of what other people are doing to us rather than on God himself. We see our conflicts as a problem between us and the other person rather than remembering that God himself is engaged and intimately involved in every aspect of our lives. And so if you want to begin to move from pain to praise, we need to take a cue from David here and recall our protector. When persecutors rise, recall your protector. Look at verses 3 and 4. He says, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory in the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. What David does here is he recalls four characteristics of the Lord as his protector. First, the Lord is his shield, he says. Over a dozen times in the Psalter, David and other authors refer to the Lord as a shield. Proverbs also, chapter 30, verse 5 says, He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. But notice what David says here in Psalm 3. He says that the Lord is not just any shield, but a shield about me. Not not in front of me, not behind me, not on my sides or above, but around, all around. That means this is not a shield that David has to take up and carry around, make sure I got it with me when I need it. David is not vulnerable to the unmitigated powers of men and all those who would seek to harm him. He knew that all the only arrows and sword thrusts that would be able to penetrate this shield would be the ones that the Lord himself intended to use to accomplish good in David's life. He would agree with Psalm 119, verse 71, which says, It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. As our shield, the Lord doesn't keep us from trouble. Excuse me, let me restate that. He doesn't keep trouble from us but he does keep us from trouble. He doesn't keep trouble from us, but he does keep us from trouble. That is to say, he allows trouble into our lives, but only insofar as he intends to use it for our good. Because he is our shield. People just can't have their way with us, do whatever they want. God himself is in control and he is protecting us. In the same way that David did not claim to be shielded by his loyal friends, who he had some pretty loyal and fierce friends. He didn't claim to be shielded by his day's distance from Absalom or just his authority and popularity. In that same way, neither should we trust in our circumstances to be our shield. It was David who also wrote in Psalm 20, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of of the Lord our God. He alone is our shield, not our bank accounts, not our job security, not our lawyers or the government or our family. As helpful as those things can be, ultimately they will fall short. The only real protection we have is the Lord. He is our shield. The second characteristic David recalls about his protector is that he is his glory. You see that in the second line of verse 3. When David fled Jerusalem, he left everything behind. Uh, There were dancers leading the train of people. He didn't carry his royal wardrobe with him. He didn't have all of the invaluable gold and precious stones of his uh, kingly glory around him. Everything was left behind. In fact, here's how 2 Samuel describes his departure from Jerusalem. But when David went up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot, and his head was covered. All the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. You can just imagine that scene of, I don't know if it was dozens or if it was hundreds, but people who were hanging their heads in shame, weeping, destitute, uncertain of what was going on, all moving in the same direction. This was no celebratory event. This was 
worse than a funeral. All the material things that typically define the glory of a king were missing. But for David, that didn't matter. Why? Because God was his glory. The outward symbols of royalty were gone, but David's glory was intact because he found his glory, that is, his identity and his significance in God himself. And the Lord was still with him. Would you agree that sometimes we blow our trials out of proportion because we place greater value in the temporary things that we might or have lost? We need to remember that with God as our glory, as the one who gives us identity and value and worth, we can lose all earthly things and still be rich in the Lord. I love these words by Asaph at the end of Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, listen, the nearness of God is my good. The nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. If we have that kind of an attitude, that when when I've lost everything else, if I still have the Lord, He is my glory and I can be content because I have everything I need. If we have that attitude, we're well on our way on the journey from pain to praise. The third characteristic David recalls about his protector is that the Lord is the lifter of his head. The lifter of his head. You see that at the end of verse 3. Now while it's true that the Lord encourages him by lifting up his downcast Head. That's not what is meant here. It means that the Lord is the one responsible for making David king. Psalm 27 verse 6 says, My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Or do you remember in Genesis when Joseph was in prison and he interpreted the, the dream of the cupbearer and he told the cupbearer that after what three days uh, that Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. So to lift up one's head in some contexts means to promote them to a higher status or position. Remember that David was not king because he was in the lineage of kings. He wasn't a king because he was the firstborn or because he was the handsomest or the smartest or the bravest. He was king solely by the fact that the Lord had anointed him king. And if the Lord wanted him to remain king the Lord would have to do it. The Lord would have to lift up his head once again. Now, what about you? Maybe when persecutors rose in your life, you lost your job. You didn't get that promotion that you were desperately wanting. Maybe you lost your career because of slander. Maybe you even lost your family or your ministry. Sin or no sin, if people rise up against you and you lose your position, recall that the Lord is the lifter of your head. God will put you where he wants you. That's what that means. If he wants you to be in a position of authority or to have a restore restoration to your office, he can do that. Or if he wants to humble you and and remove that from you, he can do that. But he is the one ultimately in charge. Don't focus on what other people are doing. God is the one ultimately responsible. Like Job, we can accept, if we can accept good from God, we can also, and we must also accept adversity because the Lord is the lifter of our head. He determines our position. The fourth characteristic David recalls about his protector is that he is a responsive protector. He is attentive To our prayers. And so you see in verse 4 that David cries out to him. David has wise and skilled counselors, and we read about them in 2 Samuel. But David starts by going first to the source of wisdom. He goes to the Lord and seeks wisdom directly from the Lord. Notice in verse 4 the word crying. I was crying to the Lord. Well, that's not talking about weeping. 
the ESV translates it, I cried aloud. Meaning this was a prayer that was not one of those quiet time devotional type prayers. This was an exasperated, desperate plea for the Lord to step in and help. And you know what? The Lord answered. The Lord responded to David. He says there, and he answered me from his holy mountain. Now, we don't know what the Lord said. We don't know what this response looked like or sounded like or what the content of it was. Did he tell David what was going to take place? We don't know. Did he just merely bring comfort or just give peace to David in, the, in his own heart? We, we don't know. But David affirms that the Lord responds to those who cry for help. And for you and I, there is a wealth of wisdom to be found in God's word. It's often the case that a person's pain is exacerbated by simply not seeking the Lord for that wisdom. I've known too many people who suffer in silence. Who for various reasons often pride just think, no, I can take care of this on my own. I can do this on my own. I don't need anybody's help. I don't need, I don't want other people to know what I'm going through. And so they just suffer and suffer and it gets worse and worse until uh, it just explodes into an uncontrollable situation. God has given us his word, his spirit, and his people to guide us and comfort us and support us in trials. The sooner that we seek help from the Lord through his resources, truth and wisdom will move us from pain to praise. Remember, when persecutors rise, recall your protector and rest In peace. Look at the effect of David's trust in the Lord in verses 5 and 6. He says, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. This is incredible. After 20 years of ruling and reigning over the nation of Israel, Now that whole nation is against him. There's just a very small number of people loyal to him who are surrounding him, but the rest of the nation is all against him, and he knows that there's going to be a plot for his life. Absalom, just the way things work, he's not going to be content with the throne. He's going to be coming after David to make sure there's no retribution. And with all of these things going on in his mind, David sleeps like a baby. We know that sleep can easily be disturbed in the night, right? Maybe for children, it's a shadow or a windstorm. For adults, there are times when concerns of life fill our minds and just push away sleep. We can be exhausted physically and emotionally spent, and yet we just can't fall asleep because our minds are racing with the troubles of life. We're worried or anxious, stressed out and fearful of what's going to happen and we just can't sleep. What we lack in those moments is peace. We lack a confident disposition that the Lord is in control and that not only is he watching over us from heaven, but he is with us in the moment, sustaining us. Now David had that confidence. He had Peace. In light of his circumstances, he, he could have been full of fear. Many would say, humanly speaking, he should have been full of fear. Instead, he was full of faith. Now, what gave him such peace? It was simply knowing that the Lord sustains him. Do you see that in verse 5? I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. In many of his psalms, David wrote words like, The Lord upholds the righteous. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down and on and on. He could sleep not because he did something, but because he trusted someone. His peace came not from having his circumstances under control, but from knowing the one who has everything under control. So where does one look when he's in need of strength? Well, he looks to the one who upholds and sustains life. Where does one turn when backed into a corner? 
He turns to the one who provides a way of escape through every trial. You know, whenever children are afraid at night, it's always a comfort to them when a parent comes to their room and says, it's okay, I'm here, it's okay. It doesn't matter really what frightened them at first, just knowing that their mom or their dad is there with them is enough to let them go back to sleep. In fact, in years past, Rachel and I often found ourselves sleeping on the floor in our boys' room because they couldn't get to sleep any other way. Then we got tired of waking up stiff, and we, we said... You come to our room and sleep on our floor. Pro tip for you young parents. If that's the case with us and our children, how much more should it be between us and our Heavenly Father? Listen, the challenge is not in getting Him to comfort us. The challenge is in us changing our thoughts about Him. When sleep is fleeting, he doesn't need to change. We need to change our thinking about him and recognize that he is with us. He's upholding us and sustaining us. It's that kind of right thinking about the Lord as sustainer that allows David to say there in verse 6, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people or tens of thousands of people. David, more than most, knew what it was to be in fearful circumstances, and yet to be strong in faith because God was capable of overcoming those circumstances. He knew that when he killed the bear or lion as a bear as a child, or when he killed Goliath as a young boy, that it wasn't him who did that. It was the Lord who strengthened him. In your storms and trials of life, you can experience that sleep-inducing peace if you too would trust in the Lord who is already near and with you. Of course, Philippians 4 says, the Lord is at hand, that is to say, he is near to you. Do not be anxious about anything, but by in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As the old hymn says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. What? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Remember, when persecutors rise, recall your protector, rest in peace, and then raise your petition. What is David's prayer? Well, you can look at it there in verse 7. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have smitten my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. David cries out to the Lord to do something. Now, of course, he's not commanding the Lord. He's just pleading with the Lord to act in this situation. His his enemy has said there is no salvation for him in God. So David says, prove them wrong, God. What is at stake here is not merely David's life, but God's glory. David's enemies have effectively taunted God's ability to save. And that's the kind of mockery that God loves to put down. The Lord loves to shame those who deride his ability to save. Now the next two lines there are translated as past tense. But they're better understood as as kind of present tense verbs that Uh, reveal how God typically acts. And so David is basically saying, God, this is how I know you act, and, and therefore I'm asking you to do this again. He says, you smite my enemies on the cheek, you shatter the teeth of the wicked. Now he's not asking God to physically do these things. These are metaphors. To to strike someone on the cheek is to shame them. In that day, if you stood before the king and you said something he didn't like, one of his servants would come over and slap you in the face, right? It's a way of invading that personal space and showing you how vulnerable you are. That happened to Micaiah in 1 Kings 22. It happened to Paul when he stood before the high priest in Acts 23. It happened to Jesus even before his crucifixion. So David affirms that God is accustomed to putting his enemies to shame. He put Goliath to shame. He put Saul to shame multiple times. 
That's what God does, and that's what He's asking God to do again. Similarly, to break the teeth of the wicked is a word picture, which means to strip them of their power. It's the idea of defanging an animal so that its bite no longer causes any injury. You know, when, when an animal wants to strike fear in, in another animal or in a person, what do they do? They, they bare their teeth, right? You take those away and now there's a whole lot less to fear. You know, a, a bear with no teeth is nothing but a gummy bear, right? Or a, a defanged snake is just a long gummy worm. So God is ask, or David is asking God to break the teeth of the wicked, which means to, in a sense, cripple them in some way so that they can't harm him. Again, David experienced this with the bear, the lion, and Goliath. He experienced it with Saul and his other enemies. He knew that God could bring Absalom to shame and prevent him from doing harm. So David prays to the Lord to rescue him to prove his ability to save and to disarm his enemies. How do we as Christians apply this? Well, Jesus taught us in Matthew 5 that when we have enemies, what do we do? We are to love them. We are to pray for them. What better way is there for God to put to shame an enemy and disarm them than by making them a friend? or even a brother or sister in Christ. At the same time, the Psalms teach us that we can ask the Lord to thwart the attempts of our enemies. If you know that someone is seeking to harm you, you can pray and ask God that He would thwart their plans, that He would remove their power and put them to shame. That's that's a legitimate prayer that we can ask. Remember, when persecutors rise... Recall your protector, rest in peace, raise your petition, and finally rise in praise. David doesn't end his prayer with a petition. He ends it with a shout of praise. Look at verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. This is a vote of confidence. It's a shout of victory before the victory is seen. This is a tribute to God who saves and redeems his people. Now, David was nowhere near out of the woods yet. He's really at the beginning of this particular trial. And yet he could praise the Lord because he knew that the Lord had plans for the future. He knew that his salvation, his uh, the outcome of this situation was not found ultimately in human wisdom. It wasn't found in military might. It would only be found in the Lord. You see, David had some idea of God's long-term plans. Again, God had made a covenant with him of what he would do with David's line. So there was no doubt in David's mind that no matter the outcome of this battle, the war was already won and the Lord's plans could not be defeated. David may not have been able to see what tomorrow looked like, but he knew that the Lord had plans for the day after tomorrow. In the midst of trials, we struggle to praise because we tend to focus on the dark clouds that surround us rather than remembering that the sun still shines above those clouds. We don't have to have it all figured out because we know the one who does have it all figured out and who is working all things out for his good purposes. Well, finally, we come to this word blessing in verse 8 for the third psalm. In a row, we see this word. This time, it's a different Hebrew word. This word blessing refers to God's favor upon those who trust in the Lord. It's often experienced through tangible benefits. And so David here is not necessarily naming and claiming blessings and benefits, but he does recognize that when the Lord saves, it does tend to improve the lives of those who trust in Him. And so he ends that psalm with a benediction, asking for the blessing of the Lord. Remember when persecutors rise, recall your protector, rest in peace, raise your petition, and rise in praise. Now in closing, let's not lose sight of the fact that David was in this situation because of his sin. So everything that he has said here applies to us, especially if our circumstances are the result of our own sin. Now, we need to emphasize that. We, we read in the Old Testament how Israel was constantly turning against the Lord. 
and yet how the Lord was constantly bringing them back when they turned to him. Even if you're in the midst of the natural consequences of your sin, don't think that you have forfeited the privilege of seeking the Lord in time of trouble. I mean, after all, wasn't it Jonah who was in the belly of a fish because of his sin of turning away from the Lord? And yet, while he was in that belly, he could cry out like David, salvation belongs to the Lord. And is this not the position of every unbeliever that they are in their mess because of their sin? And yet when they cry out for repentance, the Lord saves and redeems. You may not be as righteous as Job or as sinful as David, but the Lord has not changed. So no matter what caused the situation you're in, know that you can cry aloud to the Lord for help. And friend, if you're not a Christian, if you're here and you just know that you've never turned your life to Christ, you've never submitted yourself and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, know that no matter what suffering you can experience as a result of your, your own sin, it pales in comparison to the wrath of God that is due to you. What you need is not initially help from your struggles. What you need is forgiveness from God himself, who will judge you if you do not turn to him. So we would urge you, don't focus on your trials primarily. If you do not know Christ, get right with God. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived the life you could not live. He lived perfect and righteous, and yet he was put to death to bear the sins of those who would trust in him. And he rose again, showing his victory over sin and death and hell. And now he demands that all bow the knee and worship him. And when you do, when you believe, when you trust in him, he forgives you, he cleanses you of all your sin, freely and gladly. And then he comes, and he comes to your aid in the challenges that you face The only prayer that God hears from an unbeliever is the prayer of repentance. So pray that prayer. Come to him. Salvation belongs to the Lord, so seek it from him. Well, what happened to David after this? 2 Samuel, chapters 16 to 18, will tell you when you read it this afternoon. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our shield, our deliverer, our savior. Lord, we recognize the reality that sin causes so much destruction and pain in our lives. Every one of us here is a sinner. Every one of us has experienced the consequences of sin, the painful results of our choices that we've made in rebellion against you. Lord, I would pray that if there are any here who have not bowed the knee to Christ, that you would save them, that you would penetrate their hard heart and bring them to salvation, that you would grant them new life in Christ. And for those who are in Christ and who continue to feel the effects of their sin, Lord, cause them to trust in you, to look to you for help, to seek wisdom and truth and guidance in your word and through your people and your spirit. May we be a people who seek refuge in you, who find salvation not in the things of this world, but in our own God who is ready to save. We thank you that you are that God, and we give you all the praise and glory for that. In Christ's name, amen.